Welcome to the Profitable NDIS Provider Podcast, where we're joined by your hosts, Tanya Gomez and Paul Bryan. In each episode, we'll be sharing valuable insights and tips to help you turn your NDIS business into a profitable venture. So whether you're just starting out or looking to take your business to the next level, you've come to the right place. Let's stop surviving and start thriving. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this awesome episode of the Profitable NDIS Provider Podcast. My name is Paul, and I'm here with my awesome co-host, Tanya. How are you going? I'm well, thanks, Paul. I think you almost forgot the name of our podcast then, but I you almost, kind of recovered. almost stumbled over it, yes. <laughs> well done. And we're joined by, by John from Aspire Hub. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining us today. G'day. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Today we're talking about all the alphabet soup in the NJS. We're talking about SIL, ILO, STA, MTA, SDA. It almost sounds like sexually transmitted diseases, I think, when you read them out like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're going to talk about what they mean and I guess the difference between them. And to do that, we're joined by John Toe from Aspire Hub. As the Chief Operating Officer at Aspire Hub, John oversees NDIS and child safety operations across Queensland and Perth with extensive experience across aged care and D&I. He is a passionate individual consistently striving to elevate Aspire Hub services and solutions and be people oriented. Welcome, John. Thanks for coming to the podcast. Thank you. Do you want to start, John, do you want to tell us a little bit more about you and a little bit more about Aspire Hub? Yeah, sure. So Aspire Hub is a predominantly a NDIS supported accommodation provider. So we are a registered provider. Uh, we are based in Queensland and we've recently moved into Perth about a year ago, uh, which is exciting. Uh, we also provide a couple of other NDIS services as well. Uh, we've recently launched our day program uh, in Queensland. Uh, which is doing really well. We've got a sensory room. We've got an indoor garden. It's beautiful. Uh, we had a huge turnout as well, so that's always good. Um, right. And we also are in the training space as well because we're always trying to attract um, people into the industry. Um, Aspire Hub was started in 2020, so we've got two directors. So initially, there was the two directors and myself um, that basically started the whole of Aspire Hub. So the two directors are a husband and wife team. Um, both directors have been in the disability sector for a combined 30 years. Um, they, have, they have held a number of different roles in the NDI space, uh, including helping another provider expand into Queensland. Now, when uh, I used to be a support worker as well, and I was working under one of the directors. And it's always really funny because, you know, we've come a long way. And throughout our journey, even before NDIs as well, one of the biggest thing that we see, or one of the biggest gap that we see was there is a very sore need for purposeful accommodation that upholds the independence, the dignity, and the privacy of people with disability. And also uh, a place where there is an environment that supports their functional capacity, uh, particularly if these people are in a shared living arrangement, uh, because even before NDIS days as well, a lot of these people who are already receiving supports live in a shared living arrangement. So when we first started Aspire Hub, one of the biggest things that we strive out, strive out to do was actually to work with builders on uh, building accommodation that is, um, that's basically an addressing the gap. So we work with a couple of investors and, and a, a select builder, and we built something of what we call a self-contained apartment. So what this means is basically rather than having a traditional housing, uh, we've got perhaps a, uh, let's say, a uh, half an acre of land, for example, uh, we could have three houses in there. And in each of this house, we've got four self-contained apartments. Each of these apartments has their own ensuite, their own living area. They've got their own parking space. Um, they've got their own, uh, um, sorry, bathroom, kitchen, living area, parking space. And um, they also have a common area as well that's linking all these units as well. And what we find is that, you know, this environment really helps them thrive and actually have ownership over their space as well. So when we first launched this product, uh, along with the services that we offer, uh, we've been doing really, really well. We've seen really great feedback from participants and their stakeholders. Uh, and at the moment, we're trying to bring that concept over to Perth as well. 
Um, it's taking a little bit of uh, massaging to do with the LGAs, uh, but hopefully we'll get there. So yeah, that's pretty much it for Aspire Hub. Oh, Amazing. That's really cool. Sounds like you've been very busy. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just saying that, yeah, we've been really busy, I think, at the moment, you know, trying, because in, even in Queensland as well, there's a lot of difficulties because uh, in Queensland, we've got different councils. So we've got Brisbane City Council, Logan City Council, and some of them are approving of the accommodation, the way it's being laid out, the design of it, and others are not in support as well, considering that we're in a housing crisis. So it's always a fun one and definitely mm. you know, keeps us busy. You, you mentioned a couple of different areas there where you guys are working across and, um, you know, looking into the housing and the supports inside. Look, for our listeners, could you explain what is SIL and how is it different from SDA? So I guess it's a misconception among a lot of the acronyms, right? But pretty much, I think apart from SDA, ST and MTA, realistically, the other acronyms are really meant for the support arrangement that's to be put in place. Right. So what you will find is that mm -hmm. uh, outside of the SDAs, a lot of the options basically means that the participants will continue to access housing in the private market uh, or by owning or renting or through social housing. Right. So supported independent living basically means that it, it's for people with higher support needs who need some level of help at home at all times. So that's pretty much 24 seven supports. Um, so this is usually uh, based on a schedule of support or a roster of care, as the NDIS calls it. So, you know, I've, when I've um, been to a couple of expos, I've been to a couple of networking events as well. And I always hear people talk about SEAL, um, you know, SEAL home. You know, this is a SEAL home. And I'm like, what is a SEAL home? What does it mean to you? Because SEAL traditionally is a support, right? Then on the other hand, you get your SDAs. So SDAs are purpose-built homes. Um, there are a few different categories of SDA. Um, basically, the purpose of SDA is to make supports uh, accessible or um, to basically make accessing supports easier. I should probably say that. So there are four main categories of that. So there's improved livability, there's robust, there's high physical, um, there's fully accessible as well. So there are different categories based on the participants' needs. So realistically, the main difference here is that SEAL is, we're talking about the support side of things, and SDA is basically the accommodation, if the participant has high needs, that will allow them to assess supports a lot easier. So that is the main difference. Yeah, great. Amazing. And yeah. So SIL funding is, uh, you know, really about the support for um, the person actually being supported, and the SDA is all about the actual physical, tangible property that they'd be living in. Yes. Pretty yeah, much it. So I guess, yeah, like I said, you know, there's always that misconception. So I think at the moment in Perth, there's a product called a seal home as well. Um, so that's basically coined by a, a developer, I believe, or a builder. Um, basically, it's homes that are more accessible uh, than a traditional home. So that's what they call it, a seal home. Mm -hmm. But I think it sort of creates the confusion that, still basically means accommodation, which it is not. So then what is ILO? How does this differ from SIL? And how does ILO work? Uh, I think ILO, I think if I were to talk about it, uh, we can literally go all day long, right? Um, I think ILO is probably the most misunderstood uh, <laughs> acronym of all time, right? So. Um, I think when we first started out, when Espaha first started out as well, we were confused about ILO and it this did take us a bit of time to actually research and understand what the hell is ILO? Like, you know, when you ask a provider, you know, they will tell you, oh, it means that a person that receives uh, more than six hours of support today, pretty much it, that's what ILO means. But it means so much more than that. So I guess the biggest difference between ILO and SEAL is that uh, in ILO, a person with a disability lives in an arrangement of their choosing. So there are, uh, what, are called, what do you call it? So ILO is a support package. They get to choose the type of living arrangement. So whether that means living by themselves, living with a housemate, uh, living with a host family, or uh, living with another person with disability as well. So there are different options here. And with ILO, it basically means that you receive support up to, sorry, above six hours of support a day, but you don't need that 24 seven supports. So ILO is a lot more flexible compared to a SEAL. 
and it takes into everyone's individual circumstances, right? Whereas still you have, you know, most of the time anyway, you have two to five people or more living in one house. Uh, traditionally, you know, you really don't have much choice over which housemate because, you know, we're trying to match up seal ratios and things like that. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's basically a roster of care approach as well, where uh, it's just basically all the supports are based off a site rather than it based on individual supports as well. So ILO is basically developed from the ground up. So there's two stages to ILO, there's stage one and stage two. Stage one is what we call exploration and design. And it's all about trying to explore the living arrangements for the participants, what, what works best for the participant, right? So we look at a number of different things. We look at their friends, their family, so the, what sort of relationships that person is trying to create or maintain. Uh, we look at the leisure side of things. What sort of activities do they access? We look at the health and well-being, including their mental health. Uh, we look at their work and study arrangements, and we look at the type of housing they want to live in. And then from there, we help to create that arrangement um, and also sort of uh, be able to arrange formal and informal support as well. So true. So we have a couple of host families that, that we do, um, and we basically manage the administrative side of things. We provide on-call management, so if they have an emergency, uh, we provide training to these host families. Uh, and, you know, we also provide a, uh, I guess, respite as well for the participants when they need it. So it's all about individual circumstances is for you to be able to live in this living arrangement, what supports do you need? So that's where we come in and say, okay, this is what we could do for you. We, we make it into a plan or we, we, uh, we, we complete the service proposal and then we implement it, right? And then once it's being implemented, we always uh, check in with the participants as a provider. We try to find out, is it working for them? Is there any adjustments that's needed? So that's IR law in its essence. Whereas with SIL, it's basically, again, you know, you implement the 24-7 supports. Yes, you go through support reviews, you know, you go through things like progress reports and things like that, but it's very, very static. Whereas with IR law, it's just a whole world of flexibility that no one has really explored or not many people have explored. From what I could tell anyway, and this is a mistake that, you know, we've made in the beginning as well. We always thought that ILO means drop-in support, but really it's mm. so much more than that. And, you know, again, I could go on for hours about this topic, but just to keep <laughs> it short, it's just, you know, very, very flexible and very individualized. That is the biggest difference. Yeah, great. So how, how then is ILO funded? Because in participants who have SIL funding, it's kind of moved to a weekly SIL funding model where they get a, a weekly fee and it doesn't, it's then up to you to have a look at, well, what participants has what fee to see what the, the, the whole, um, what the, I guess the whole budget is for staffing for that house. How then does that funding side work for ILO? Is it just the support hours and it won't there be, there, there's not then the requirement for them to share with somebody else to be able to fill those 24 hours roster of care? Yeah, not at all. So it, so basically supports are still planned on an average weekly basis of ILO. So uh, the NDIS has recently sort of, uh, revise the service proposal. So it's a lot more detailed now, and it does ask you uh, a lot of different things, including what your what your ideal living arrangements would look like. So what I mean by that is, for example, um, it, uh, in the proposal itself, we would put in there on an average week, what would supports look like? So for example, uh, on a Monday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., um, uh, sorry, or every day, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., Participant A would require supports of medication, uh, would require supports in uh, sort of daily household tasks that he or she can't do. So again, it's all about that one person. So we do not have to consider any other participants, it's all about the participant, right? So um, we look at, you know, 9 to 12 p.m., what sort of supports we can put in, right? So between 12 and 2, for example, um, there will be info informal supports that comes in. It could be uh, A's parents coming in to help out, for example. And then between two and four is their downtime. So they do not want to have any supports. And then from six to 10, you know, there could be assistance with meal preparation and things like that. So again, this with ILO, it's just, again, there's a lot more uh, ind individualization. So it's not like, again, still where, you know, you get weekly funding and that's pretty much it, 
right? ILO, it's still weekly funding, but at the end of the day, it's weekly funding based on your individual circumstances, not based on, you know, the circumstances of multiple different participants, which is the beauty of it all, right? Um, and I think, you know, my, like my I said, we've had really successful... Oh, sorry. 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 I was going to ask, with my question there would be, I've seen that over a period of time, SIL funding getting smaller and smaller for participants. Is there then a different type of person who is getting ILO versus SIL? Is there a, are the needs less? Is that why there's this more flexible accommodation or, you know, um, supported accommodation, supported supports inside accommodation? Uh, is, is this, is, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how can the NGIS fund ILO with so, with so much flexibility where SIL funding seems to be reducing and reducing? Is it just that mm. the needs level is less or is this, you know, is this seen as SIL 2.0 and SIL participants will go across to ILO? Yeah, look, I definitely don't think it's a SIL 2.0. And you are right that SIL funding is, is gradually being reduced. But what ILO funding really does is it looks at supports as a whole, right? So including informal supports. So to put it bluntly, informal supports, could, again, mean family, friends, you know, housemates, right? Where the funding is not as, I guess, uh, expensive as a traditional SIL funding. So. There is yeah. definitely a smaller funding that's required. Where also in SIL, there's less so much involvement of informal supports. A lot of yeah. it is based on a SIL provider going and providing all of the supports. And yeah. it is a lot more uh, costly that way. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's replacing, you know, it's not SIL to point, definitely for sure. SIL has always been or should be reserved for participants with much higher needs and definitely yeah. around the clock care. Whereas ILO is less supports, but it also means incorporating informal supports in there, making sure that, you know, eventually, right, the goal for them is, well, depending on what their goals are, but I guess is to make sure that they can integrate into the community a lot better uh, than a traditional SEAL, because yeah. SEAL, like I said, is very static. So in my head, then, I've made the assumption that SIL is really then for higher level participants like you'd see in an SDA house because to be eligible for SDA, you have to meet certain eligibility criteria, um, which includes not having informal supports. So that an, a SIL provision would be with inside an SDA home and obviously could be outside an SDA home if they didn't have SDA funding. Um, but then ILO is then used for people who need a mix of different funding, including including supporting their home or in a, a shared home environment. So maybe then mm -hmm. in my head, again, I try to put everything in a box. We've got that SIL is a, a higher level, more complex supports. So it's more costly and that's why it's a fixed weekly rate where ILO can be more flexible because it's trying to work with an individual who may or may not be living with other people with disability who may have lesser support needs. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you know, some participants will prefer receiving supports from a housemate, right? Or from a, a, yeah. a, 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 someone who is a lot more, I guess, informal in that sense. So SEAL has always been, like I said, very formal. So you have a staff pretty much uh, sort of supporting you everywhere you go. But where else if I allow you know, it's sort of that relationship that they build as well. Uh, but also, I do have to say as well, sometimes, you know, IL, there are ILO participants in SDA, so there is definitely that mix as well. Um, but it, again, it does depend on what their needs are. But generally, I guess, you know, you would be right in saying that still are your more complex participants, um, but it really does yeah. depend on the type of need that they have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so does it does it then? I mean, is there does it then come down to how good is their support coordinator for which funding they could get? You know, is it is that kind of the differentiating thing, or is it really just about the participants' need? Because mm -hmm. I have a hard time believing oh, that question. anything in the IDS isn't kind yeah. of to the benefit of the government. Well, I guess it, it, it's it, it is a definitely a good question here, and I think you know uh, there are a lot of uh, expectations from family as well. And uh, I guess from people of what supports it should be, right? So, for example, I've got participants where they do not need that full 24-7 supports, but family members or the guardians believe that, no, they require that full 24-7 supports. So 
then we ended up trying to, you know, uh, go for self-funding when they might not need it at the end of the day. But for me, it's not about how good the support coordinator is because ILO is really, really challenging in that sense because, again, I would say that the knowledge in ILO at the moment is much lower than SEAL. So for people who can't get SEAL traditionally, I, I would assume that they would try and get ILO because I, to them that would be the next best step. But I see ILO as a genuine alternative to SEAL. So it's not a matter of how good the support coordinator is, but it's a matter of what does a participant want? What is their ideal living arrangement at the end of the day? If we can work that out, then obviously we can try and either go for SEAL or we go for ILO. But like I said, you know, at the end of the day, if SEAL doesn't work, most people will be like, okay, let's try for ILO next, which is a bit disappointing, but because ILO means a lot more uh, and we, I definitely do not want to trivialize it. Um, but mm. when SEAL, when you can't get SEAL, ILO would be the next best thing I would, you know, for them in that sense. Right. Yeah, right. Okay. Look, let, let's continue through the alphabet soup and, and look at uh, S, STA. And so, you know, that idea of STA, and I've had, heard a lot of people talking about STA and respite. Look, STA and respite, are they the same thing? How is it funded? What does this actually look like? So STA and respite, as far as I know of, it's one and the same. Uh, I've not heard it being any different, um, which it is a bit of a shocker to me. I guess, you know, when people, you know, when you do ask that question, I'm like, okay, it's, it's pretty much one and the same. So NDIs traditionally funds up to 28 days of STA, depending on what their needs are. Um, and each of this uh, STA stay can be up to 14 days long. Now, STA comes from the core funding. So it, you know, core funding is pretty flexible. So even if you're not funded for it, but technically if you're not fully utilizing your plan, you could use your core funding for uh, short-term accommodation as well. That's not a problem at all. Um, when NDIS is, uh, I guess, deciding on whether to fund STA in your plan, they look at a few different things as well. So the biggest point of STA is to make sure that your family or informal supports can support the participant for longer. Right, that is the primary purpose of STA, as well mm -hmm. as uh, you know other things like trying to make sure that you know you can go out and enjoy new activities. You know, we've seen that whole barrage of support holidays. That's all from STA funding as well. Um, so mm -hmm. you know that falls in line with that new activities. Um, and but yeah, like I said, STA traditionally meant for ensuring that your informal supports or your carers can get some respite away, so that your long term supports can be in place. Uh, it is also very funny. I used to have a really, really complex participant in Perth that I was about to take on as well. And uh, they had a provider that relinquished care um, because the participant is highly aggressive, you know, engaged in a lot of property damage outside of home, so in the community and inside of home as well. And one of the things I suggested to the, uh, the support coordinator, which I thought was, um, you know, I, I think it was creative on my end. <laughs> I didn't get it in the end, but I think we should. Was that, you know, how about we look at us as a sale provider coming for two months and then we have an SDA accommodation for this participant for two weeks for us to recharge as a sale provider because it's the reset community burnout. It's the reset so sale provider burnout as well. We are carers at the end of the day. So, you know, why can't we do that? Uh, I believe the support coordinator asked the question to the planner. I don't believe we got it, but I do think that it could be. <laughs> something worthwhile <laughs> so well, so yeah have, that's what SGA is. i have a question about the 28 days for respite so is that 28 yeah. days for every participant because you said that they can claim up to 28 days but then it depends if that's in your plan so would everyone get 28 days or is it is it like if i had a child with disability versus an adult with disability or if i had someone with you know more complex needs do those people get more respite or is it just a blanket everyone gets 28 days how how does that work um no it's funded up to 28 days so definitely not built up to 28 days um so again there, there is a diff, uh, a number of different factors as well including the sort of needs that they require so again uh, it's it's still following the funding criteria, the usual funding criteria of NDIS. So when we when we speak about STA, I guess we have to prove uh, about um, uh, I guess why is that STA needed and how long it's needed, right? So if we let's say we have a participant on an ILO, for example, 
uh, and to give the carers a break, you know, every couple of months, they might need, let's say, a weekend of respite. So if we put that into the service proposal, then we are looking at possibly only eight days worth of respite. So it, it all depends on what is reasonable and necessary here. Mm, okay. And I know that reasonable right. and necessary at the moment is of hot debate, but yes, reasonable <laughs> and necessary. <laughs> yeah. So the last acronym is MTA, and I'm wondering if you can explain how or well, what is the purpose of MTA um, and mm -hmm. then how long is MTA being medium term accommodation and how does the funding around MTA work? So. MTA is really only funded when you're waiting for your long-term accommodation. So NDRs will fund up to 90 days. Uh, I believe I've seen instances where it's above 90 days, um, but that has been pretty, pretty rare. Um, traditionally, it's more to, again, it's when you have a, a long-term accommodation in place, but for uh, reasons such as, uh, you know, uh, for example, if you're doing home modifications, you have to wait for your home modifications to be completed. Um, and then at that point of time, obviously, um, the NDRs will fund for MTA up to the point where the home modifications get done. Or let's say if you are in, uh, you're waiting for an SDA to open up. So currently there's a participant in the SDA. The participant is going to move out in 28 days. NDRs will then fund you for 28 days MTA. So it all depends on when that long-term solution would be ready. So... Um, Things like hospital discharge as well. So if you're getting discharged from hospital, but you don't have a long-term solution in place, tra traditionally what we'll see is uh, a lot of the discharges will have MTA placed into their plans. Um, this yeah. is so that they can come out into the community a lot sooner uh, and then they can explore the different housing options or wait for that long-term solution to be put in place. Yeah. And, and I think uh, that that's where, where it can get confusing for people is that I've had a number of clients assume that if you're in hospital, you'd get short term accommodation until you until, you know, if you're waiting for home modifications because you've, you know, something's happened and you can't return to home without it being safe, you'd get mm -hmm. short term accommodation um, because it should be short term. But really short term accommodation is referring to respite. So, like, it, I think the, just the labels that are given, you know, and, and the mm, difference between yeah. supported independent living and independent living options, like, just the wordings and the semantics, I guess, of it can be quite confusing because you, you kind of try to look for logic in things and go, well, I'm leaving hospital. I need something short term. Surely that's short term accommodation. No, what you're looking at is medium term accommodation. And then I've had people mm. ask me the question of, well, is short term accommodation a week and medium term accommodation two weeks? And it's like, no, <laughs> like, no, that's it. Mm. That sounds really logical. But no, that's not actually how it works. But I think I think it makes a lot of sense for me if someone's in hospital, they need to get medium term accommodation. The word doesn't make sense, but the idea, the concept makes sense. Yes. Um, and if yes. you're waiting for, if, yeah. if you've got approval for an SDA and you've got to wait a year for your house to be built and it's not safe and secure where you are currently, if you're not in a SIL home, if you're in, you know, maybe transitional, uh, transitional house, it would make sense then that you could get funding while your SDA is being built for medium term accommodation. That makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. as well. Um, but yeah, I think I think sometimes it's just the naming conventions we give it that makes it seem more overwhelming to navigate. It seems 100%. like you've got it all sorted in, out in your house, in your head, though, and you can just go, no, that fits there and that fits there because you've had so 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 much experience with it. Yeah, I think it's definitely challenging, even for providers as well, and that's why sometimes you know I feel you know, I feel for the for the participants at the end of the day, especially if, you know, if you're managing the plan by yourself or you're a family member managing for one of your children or one of your... It is very, very challenging because the the terms itself, again, like what Tanya has put in, is that, you know, it's very logical, right? Short term would mean seven days or 14 days and medium term would mean 28 days kind of thing. It's, that's what's only logical. But I guess, you know, the, I don't know who did the naming con conventions, but I... You know, it's something that will definitely need a bit of revision. Really down the line to live with. 
it's kind of like support coordination yeah. having three levels but being in two different registration groups and the difference between coordination of support or support coordination like surely there was another name we could call that <laughs> surely we could have just called it <laughs> case management or like you know it, it just kind of and even the registration group of accommodation and tenancy which is actually to help people find it i still i had one this week where someone got registered for accommodation and tenancy and they're like i can do sill i was like no you can't <laughs> Let's, no, you went through the whole audit process with the wrong registration group it's like <laughs> no that helps you be a support coordinator and help them find it oh i want to be yes. i want to get airbnbs with it no <laughs> that's not what you can do yeah. i think yeah i think it's quite complex yeah i think it was you know, a really um, good well, committee so that came up with all these names i'm sure yeah and I think yeah. I was going through a, a, a variation of registration as well. And I was looking through the groups that I needed to apply for. And I looked at them I'm like, oh, no, this is doing my head. And I called my auditor and was like, can you just tell me what I need to actually do? Yeah, because it got too confusing mm -hmm. for me as well. So I can only say, you know, if we struggle, then what ch what sort of chances do some of the participants have really? It's, yeah, it's a tough one. Well, tough one for sure. There was actually a study done. So I'm doing a PhD at the moment, looking at things in the NGS space. And my supervisor has done her PhD in looking at the participants journey through the NGIS. And her findings were that you need a master's degree or higher level of education to navigate as a participant, the participants journey. So I mean, that kind of tells you because the Australian education system is an AQF levels. And it, she says it's an AQF level six, the, the language that the documentation is written in. So I mean, that kind of mm. tells you something, I think the providers would be the same, um, you know, as far as how it's written, like, sometimes I can read a letter from the NGOs commission 10 times and still mm. not understand it. So I, I really wonder, I think I've made this joke many times that I think they use chat GBT to say, make this as confusing as possible, please, because that's the only way it would make sense yes. to me that we get letters like this. <laughs> yeah, especially some of the names like, you know, could be cut really short, short term accommodation could have just been respite. I think everyone would have understood what it meant. Uh, and, mm. you know, MTA could be temporary accommodation. That would have been it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just crazy sometimes. Yeah. But that so, would have yeah. made life simple. Cool. I, I, so, <laughs> I'll throw you, Paul. Sorry, Tanya. Okay. All I'll good. Throw to you. Hey, look, well, I, I was just looking at you know some of those things we've looked at today. You know, between all those acronyms, um, I really appreciate that you've actually done your time to look at all these different bits and pieces because obviously Aspire Hub is you know uh, you know tracking across all these different areas and you've got to stay on top of it. And I think it really highlights probably for a lot of our listeners, uh, first of all, is that, you know, if you are operating any of these spaces, you need to really have the information because it is convoluted, um, you know, so being on top of that information is key, but also, you know, having a very good understanding of that space you're in. If you're right across accommodation and know all these, but if you're just operating, you know, as a provider and doing that respite, then you don't need to worry too much about ILO and SILOs but know everything about that STA funding and how it works and who should get it and all that sort of thing. So that was really good insight today, mate, and I really appreciate you coming on and, and uh, giving our listeners a bit of insight into these different accommodation uh, solutions that obviously Aspire Hub is across. Um, if someone wants to get in touch with you and, and, and find out more about what you guys do, how can they do that? Um, they can visit our website. So all our, all, our, all information about our services are listed on our website. Uh, if, every, if anyone wants to come down and have a chat with myself, uh, even just for a coffee, even, um, they can look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, so my name is John Toe. So if you look up John Toe on LinkedIn, I wouldn't be hard to find. Um, so, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. It was really great to have you here to have this chat with us. And um, next time you come to Perth again, we should definitely catch up. It's um, always yeah. wonderful to speak to, to speak to you and hear about the amazing things you guys are doing. Thank you. And I just want to say, you know, when we first started out, we don't have anyone like yourselves that we could speak to to help us out in this industry. So I'm glad you guys are here because, you know, we've seen quite a huge search in providers. Some are, might not be in for the right reasons and some are in for the good reasons but might not know what to do. So I'm glad that you guys are in this space to help them out as well. Oh, thank you. Thank That's you very lovely. Much. Um, yeah. 
Um, and that is it for this week. Next week, we will be back next Tuesday with another amazing episode of the Profitable NGIS Provider Podcast. If you too are enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review or a rating um, and we look forward to speaking to you again next week. Um, thanks, Paul. And thanks, John. I'll see you soon. Thanks. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Profitable NDIS Provider Podcast with Tanya Gomez and Paul Bryan. We hope you found today's episode informative and valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to subscribe, leave us a rating and share it with others who could benefit from our insights. Until next time, keep thriving.